Marcus Freeman and the Notre Dame coaching staff secured two big commitments over the weekend, and there might just be a few more on the way. Notre Dame recruiting insider Kyle Kelly joins me with the latest coming up next. You are Locked On Irish, your daily podcast on the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's going on and welcome into Locked On Irish. It is Thursday, April 27th, and thank you for getting your day started here by making this your first listen of the day. As always, you can watch the show on YouTube or listen wherever you get your podcast. And whether you're watching or listening, you can stay up to date on all future episodes by hitting that subscribe button. My name is Tyler Wojcik, and I'm the host. I'm a Notre Dame alum and a producer for our college football personalities at the Fox Sports headquarters in LA. And in just a few moments, I'm going to be joined by Kyle Kelly, recruiting insider for blueandgold.com. Kyle covered the Irish for Inside ND Sports on the Rivals Network before he joined Blue and Golden on 3 in February of this year. So he's been around the program for a while now and has his ear to the ground at all times when it comes to Notre Dame recruiting. At the time of this recording, we still don't know where Tyler Buckner is going to end up. Buckner entered the transfer portal on Tuesday, and I recorded an emergency podcast right after he announced where I basically just reacted to the news and shared my thoughts on the whole situation as it relates to his future and Notre Dame's as well. So if you haven't listened to that episode yet, I'd encourage you to check it out once you're done listening to this one. We know that Buckner visited Alabama the day after he announced. That's been reported and confirmed by multiple different outlets at this point. And the Crimson Tide seem to be the favorite to land him, but he likely has plenty of other suitors, so we'll see how it plays out. He did say he was open to coming back to Notre Dame, and even though I don't think that's going to happen, we'll just have to wait and see uh, how it plays out. Once he makes his decision will obviously have you covered here on this podcast. Plus, the NFL draft kicks off tonight, and I'm very excited to see where Michael Mayer ends up. So I'll likely talk about that in tomorrow's pod once he gets selected. Okay, let's talk to Kyle. All right, Kyle Kelly from blueandgold.com joins us now. First off, welcome to the show. Uh, but let's dive right into it because these past several weekends have been critical to Notre Dame's recruiting operation. But this past weekend was particularly important, though, given the spring game and all the festivities surrounding that. And you put out on the message boards that you were hearing a lot of great buzz about what Notre Dame did for the recruits that were in town for the spring game. So take us through some of those key developments from this past weekend. Yeah, well, uh, thanks for having me, Tyler. Uh, certainly been a uh couple of days coming out of that uh blue gold game i think we certainly expected it to be a pretty big uh visitors weekend for notre dame but i'm not sure we expected uh two commitment dates to be set and uh you know some other positive developments behind the scenes but i think that's really just a result of uh irish coaching staff doing a great job um you know on a big weekend i think it was super important to have the the class headliner uh, C.J. Carr, of course, the quarterback there, um, he he really made a big impression on a lot of guys this weekend. And part of the reason he wanted to lock in his pledge so early was to recruit guys in Notre Dame. And, you know, that certainly kind of took a back seat um, at, at some points during his process. But, you know, when it matters most, C.J. has been in South Bend and he did a uh, great job this weekend, as did Marcus Freeman, Chad Bowden, director of recruiting and uh, really the whole staff. Uh, just kind of in summary, I mean, the sort of the biggest developments coming out of this weekend are uh, Bryce Young and Micah Gilbert uh, setting commitment dates. Um, both attend the uh, same high school, uh, Charlotte Christian uh, in North Carolina, obviously. And uh, Bryce is a Notre Dame legacy commit and or excuse me, he's not committed, but um, a Notre Dame legacy target. Uh, his father, of course, is Bryant Young, a former Irish standout, a Pro Football Hall of Famer. He got honored during the game uh, just for uh, some pretty standard recognition. But I, I think that was a really important uh, weekend for the Young family to be up on campus. And, you know, obviously, I, I think you have to like Notre Dame there. Um, Mike Singer, uh, my counterpart at Blue and Gold and myself, have both logged on three um, expert recruiting uh, predictions, which basically is our uh, prediction on where a uh, target is going to commit. And we both like where Notre Dame's trending there. Um, as far as Micah Gilbert, Mike and I have not made any uh, public uh, predictions, but we both have been uh, pretty optimistic behind the scenes. And I think anytime you see a, a prospect set a commitment date, uh, you know, a couple of days after visiting campus for the first time, that, that usually bodes well uh, for any school. So I think that's one you have to like, especially with uh, him going to the same high school as uh, Bryce Young. 
Um, Young being a defensive lineman, Gilbert being a, a four-star wide receiver. That's a guy that Notre Dame really likes and would be super happy if he ended up in the class. So those were just some of the positive developments coming out of the weekend, and um, I'm sure we're expecting a, a lot more over the next 10 days or so. So there's a lot I want to get to, and we'll get to CJ Carr in a little bit, but let's talk about Gilbert and Young. Um, they obviously haven't committed yet, but if they were to commit to Notre Dame, what would Notre Dame be getting out of those two players? Yeah, I guess I'll start with Young because he, he's got really the the more interesting story. He camped at Notre Dame over the summer. Um, he picked up a Notre Dame offer. No other school has really offered him besides Duke, and he finally blew up after his – uh, junior season, he picked up offers from USC, Michigan, uh, Tennessee. Those are some of the notable ones. I think his finalists, actually. Um, several other Power 5 schools in there as well. And th- one thing that kind of came out of his visit this weekend is Notre Dame told him that, hey, we offered you way back in June when you were, you know, 215 pounds, six foot four. His height hasn't changed at all, but uh, he's always been a priority for Notre Dame, especially as a legacy kid. Uh, Notre Dame saw it early in him that he had a lot of potential way before any of the recruiting services did, way before any of the other teams. And I think that message sort of resonated with him this weekend. That's part of the reason why I like uh, Notre Dame trending for him. Uh, for the longest time, he was really considered an athlete for the process, during the process, but uh, some of the recruiting services, I think actually all four of the primary ones being ESPN, On3, Rivals, and 24-7 Sports, I think they all have them rated as an edge rusher at this rate. And I think that's where we kind of expect him to end up if he ends up choosing Notre Dame. Um, kind of, uh, he's a big body guy. He's up to, I think, around 240 pounds now. Uh not sure if I exactly see him playing that Viper position, like that weak side hybrid um, outside linebacker defensive end, but he certainly has the frame uh, to play like a that big end, like your Riley Mills, like that strong side sort of defensive end. And I, I think that, uh, you know, once he gets to any college campus, they can put a lot of weight on him and uh, he can certainly hold up on that position. With Micah Gilbert, his recruitment was uh, pretty interesting for Notre Dame. Uh, They've been by Charlotte Christian uh, on the recruiting trail a lot between last football season and this winter, Uh, mostly checking in with uh, Bryce Young, or at least that's what they told us uh, behind the scenes. But as it turns out, they were also evaluating a talented four-star wide receiver with um, a lot of attention from the ACC, uh, Michigan, one of the schools from the Midwest that heavily targeted him and it kind of heading into this weekend, I didn't really necessarily expect Micah Gilbert to be trending pretty heavily to Notre Dame coming out of it. I, I kind of figured this would be just an introductory visit, but I think this is just sort of your classic case of when a kid gets on campus, you never know what can happen. And obviously he hasn't made any decision public yet. Um, I know Michigan's pushing really hard there. Um, he really likes the Wolverines, so that's a school to watch as well. But uh, I think that's an excellent example of, hey, once a kid gets on campus for the first time, like Notre Dame can just blow them away. And from everything we're hearing coming out of the weekend, I think that's kind of um, what happened and why you know both those guys are uh, trending to Notre Dame. Yeah, it's hopefully Notre Dame can get them over the line here and, and secure those commitments. And that's interesting about Bryce Young and Notre Dame being so early on him. I think it's easy to think, okay, well, he is a legacy. His dad was a legend at Notre Dame. Of course, they're going to offer him. But then once these other schools started to jump in and offer him too, it kind of shows like, oh, Notre Dame was actually onto something here. Even though they did have the benefit of the legacy, they were. It's easy to. It's probably easier for Notre Dame to spot that kind of talent. But now I think the rest of the world is seeing that Bryce Young is. Uh, and this Bryce Young is uh, really climbing up the charts. Where is he currently ranked right now in the on three rankings? Uh, he is uh, in the three hundred for sure, which that's kind of like your, like the blue chip sort of players, like your four stars and five yeah. stars. Uh, on three currently has him ranked as the number two hundred and thirty six overall player, uh, number twenty two overall edge, and number eight player in North Carolina. So. Certainly a super solid um, get there if they can pull that one off. We have them ranked uh, the highest out of all the other four major recruiting services, and 
yeah, I mean that that's a uh, top two fifty player, you know, top twenty five at his position, and a Notre Dame legacy that has a lot of potential. So there's no doubt Notre Dame would be super excited for him to end up in the class. Yeah, and his stock could keep going up. Uh, he's still got one more season left to play, so that'll be interesting to follow. Looking for a delicious snack but don't want all of the sugar and calories? Then you need the best tasting protein bar ever. Built, you gotta try this. If you're like me and wanna make healthier snack choices but you don't wanna compromise on taste, I've got just the thing for you. Built Bars and Built Puffs. Built Bars are healthy and taste amazing. Seriously, they taste so amazing, you won't think they're good for you. You gotta try them. What makes Built Bars so good? Well, for starters, they're covered in 100% real dark chocolate. That's right, real chocolate, and they come in unbelievable flavors like churro, peanut butter brownie, and cookies and cream. I'm not sure how Built does it, but these bars taste like a candy bar while maintaining amazing macros. And what's even better is that they're healthy with only 130 calories and four grams of sugar with a whopping 17 grams of protein. And now you don't need to wait to get a box. For years, we've been talking about ordering Built Bars at Built.com, but now you can get them at your local Walmart or Sam's Club, or you can still get your specialty flavors at Built.com. That's right. Head to your nearest Walmart today, walk to the pharmacy section, and grab yourself a box of Built Bars. You can pick up a four-bar box of cookies and cream, double chocolate bar, or coconut puffs. And if you're close to Sam's Club, run in and grab a 13-bar box with our hit flavors, brownie batter puff and churro puff. You can thank me later. Two of the most high-profile visitors in South Bend this past weekend are actually Notre Dame commits. You mentioned C.J. Carr, the four-star quarterback, and then five-star wide receiver Cam Williams. You wrote a very interesting piece this week on blueandgold.com about how Cam Williams um, helped keep C.J. Carr locked in with Notre Dame after Tommy Reese left for Alabama. How crucial was Williams' relationship with Carr in keeping the quarterback locked into Notre Dame? Yeah, that was something that um, really surprised me uh, in my conversations with Carr at the uh, Elite 11 um, Regional in Massillon, Ohio from over the weekend. And, uh, I, you know, I've covered CJ for a long time. Um, I first talked to him in person over uh, like 13 months ago at the Under Armour camp in Columbus. And I feel like we've always had a great relationship. I've talked to him in person several times. And one thing that CJ told me early on in his recruitment is that Tom Uris was just 100% the – the primary reason why he was so interested in Notre Dame. Then of course he gets on campus around Marcus Freeman and things like that. And it all starts to come together and it just ends up becoming home for him. But at the forefront was always Tommy Reese. He loved Tommy. Tommy was a big, big piece of his recruitment. And I remember always asking CJ like, Hey, if, if Tommy leaves Notre Dame, like how is this going to affect your recruitment? And something he told me was, I kind of expect uh, Marcus Freeman to to make the right hire, and I'm going to trust Marcus. And you know, I'm I'm totally locked in with Notre Dame. And while this was that, before he left. Yeah, that was this was okay. um, when CJ committed in June. I talked to him around that time. So anyway, after Tommy re, uh, Tommy leaves, I don't think CJ expected it to happen this early, and I think it kind of caught him off guard. And obviously, just naturally. Got to kind of take a step back and reevaluate things. And, you know, Tommy is certainly going to recruit CJ to Alabama. Um, he's a five star level quarterback. I mean, Alabama offered him before Reese even got there. So there was a lot to consider um, in CJ's recruitment. Meanwhile, he was out with his seven on seven team, touring schools from all across the country. And I think naturally you're just kind of trying to let everything digest and, not really knowing which way this whole thing is going to kind of play out before he was able to get, get to campus. But I, I didn't, I, you know, this is bad reporting on my part, to be honest, but I didn't really clarify with CJ if he was ever thinking about backing off his pledge or decommitting or anything like that. And I wouldn't say I ever got that sense from him, but I think that his commitment was weakened when Tommy Reese left and, Cam Williams, the wide receiver commit, uh, was the one that strengthened it. He kept uh, CJ in the fold. He kept him locked in. He kept him engaged with the class. And pretty much his message was, hey, you can't leave us and all these connections you've built at Notre Dame. And I think that's something that really resonated with CJ. And I, I want to make sure I clarify, I, I, you know, I don't really ever think that decommitting or backing off his pledge was actually on the mind of CJ Carr. It was just more so of Cam kind of tell, like making sure to let him know like, Hey, 
this is why you can't even consider that. It's because you've invested so much already. And in in another sense, a lot of these guys have put their faith in C- CJ, uh, Cam Williams, and then Jack Larson, a 2024 tight end commit. They basically both committed to Notre Dame from their um, connection they had with CJ at the Irish Invasion Camp last June. So a, a lot of stock around CJ and from the Notre Dame football program and the recruits and you know, Kim Williams obviously played a huge role in uh, kind of picking CJ back up when things were down and keeping him uh, locked in with the Irish. That's so interesting to me because normally I would sort of dismiss uh, like connections between recruits, especially if they didn't go to high school in, the, in a nearby area. Um, but it sounds like this class for Notre Dame in 2024 has a really tight bond. And and that's really encouraging because right now there's only 10 commits in the class. You'd like to see that number grow, and it probably will be here uh, very soon. But the evaluation on Carr has been sort of all over the map lately, depending on which site you're looking at. But the consensus is still that he's, he's, he's a very talented quarterback. That's a big reason why he was invited to the Elite 11 Finals this summer. But you've mentioned how you've seen him in person several times. You've seen him uh, at different camps and things like that. What's your evaluation on his game? Like, how talented of a prospect do you think CJ Carr is? I went and saw CJ um, play high school game last season, middle of last season. His team just absolutely tore it up. But uh, there were a couple passes that I was a little bit skeptical. I was like, "Wow, I, I thought CJ, you know, would be have a little bit more touch on this, or um, you know, maybe he would have done this uh, a little bit differently, or, or things like that." I think he actually threw an interception or two that game. But I think that was just kind of the growth uh, with him as a prospect. And the level of competition he plays in is certainly not like your top tier Georgia or Texas or Florida. And, of course, you're not going to get that um, in a lot of the places in the United States. But, uh, you know, then he goes on the playoff game, first playoff, or I think maybe the second. And uh, although his team lost, he hangs like 44 points or something. So. Uh, he kind of had a tumultuous season from that aspect, but I, I really kept a super close eye on him at the lead 11 and I was just blown away by his performance. And, you know, the lead 11, it's a quarterback camp. It's meant for quarterbacks to shine, but CJ was just 100% head and shoulders there above everybody else. Uh, he throws such a catchable ball. He's got great touch. You can just tell he's, he's got that quarterback DNA. You know, his dad was a quarterback at Michigan. His grandpa's Lloyd Carr. Um, you know, I, I believe his uh, mom's dad was a quarterback as well. He's just got it in him, and it comes so natural. And you can see, I mean, I think that Notre Dame really caught a really good prospect in Carr. And, you know, if, if I had to, to put stars on him, I'd say he's a five-star. He's just got that that mental makeup. He's got the intangibles. He's just got that it factor. And just watching him all come together from a physical aspect last Sunday, it's just like a no brainer that this guy is one of the best quarterbacks in the uh, 24 class. We made it this far and we haven't even talked about the two guys who committed to Notre Dame this past weekend. Um, One in the class of 2024 and edge rusher Cole Mullins, and then somewhat of a surprise commitment in the class of 2025 with Davion Dixon. What led to their commitments? Yeah, I think uh, Cole Mullins uh, it was a guy that Notre Dame offered back in January. And one thing that stuck out right away about his offer is you can kind of tell, like, you know, what sort of kids are really prioritizing academics in the recruitment. And one thing that stuck out about Cole Mullins is he had been to Wake Forest a couple times. Um, I think he had also been to – Duke as well, you know, both highly regarded academic institutions. And right away that kind of caught my attention and it was like, well, you know, if Notre Dame gets in the mix, like, here we go. Like uh, uh, a player that's valuing education and then Notre Dame act absolutely has that fo- football aspect as well. And as it turned out, that was just uh, the perfect combination. He, Went up to campus one time, he fell in love and committed to the staff. And that's pretty much as easy as it was. He liked uh, what Notre Dame had to offer. And, you know, Cole's definitely an underrated uh, prospect in this uh, recruiting cycle. You know, he doesn't have a lot of high-end Power 5 offers. He's getting – he has a lot of ACC schools. uh, And there's really not a lot of attention from some of the 
you know, blue bloods in his area. I mean, Georgia being one of them or like Florida or Alabama or like any of those SEC schools, he's kind of a lower end power five prospect, but Notre Dame sees a lot of potential in him. He was a surprise. I don't think anyone really expected him to commit last week, but like I mentioned, what kind of put my antennas up was him visiting Wake Forest and Duke both on two separate occasions and, just one quick example of that was Ben Minnick, the uh, freshman in role safety. Uh, during his process, he had been on an official to wake. Um, there were a couple high academic institutions he was considering as well. And as soon as Notre Dame offered him, he committed on the spot. So uh, that's kind of a similar situation with Cole Mullins. Obviously, it took a little bit more time uh, for him to see campus and that sort of thing. But with uh, Davion Dixon, um, this was one that Mike Singer and I kind of just had like a gut feeling that maybe something could happen if everything came together the right way. I don't think we would ex- say we'd expect it, but we kind of thought in the back of our minds that there was a chance there just because Dixon had camped up at Notre Dame uh, over the summer in front of Al Washington. And uh, we spoke to Davion uh, about a month before his Notre Dame visit, and he was super high on the Irish. She basically said, they were in his top three with Florida and uh, Florida State, but uh, I, you know, certainly that's that commitment wasn't expected either. You know, I'm I, I was just hanging around on a Friday night, and uh, Davian Dixon messaged me on Twitter and said, "Hey, I just committed to Notre Dame." I was like, kind of blew my mind. I was like, "Wow, it just this is what it took." Like you were on campus for just a couple hours, but. That's a, a recruiting victory for Al Washington and uh, Marcus Freeman there. They both did a great job uh, hosting him on Friday. They made him feel at home. And, uh, yeah, that's super surprise. He's still, as a 2025 prospect, a high school sophomore, very young. You can tell there's got to be a lot of development there. Uh, he's about 6'2", 310. Uh, you're going to want to see him kind of lean up and um, put on more muscle and He's certainly got a lot of times, a lot of time to do that, but uh, he's dominated his high school competition so far. And guys that size just don't come around to Notre Dame every day. And that's a that's a big gift for Notre Dame to get the 2025 cycle up and up and rolling. And uh, yeah, that's a that's a prospect that uh, was a, a nice little surprise coming into the blue blue gold game weekend. So Dixon is in the class of 2025. Let's get back to the class of 2024, uh, this current recruiting class for Notre Dame. As you see it, what positions do you think are Notre Dame's biggest needs still left on the board? Safety. Um, that's the biggest one by far. Uh, Could not Mar- agree more. <laughs> yeah, Marcus Freeman, Al Golden, they've all said it on the record uh, in front of the media with the lights on, cameras on, mics on, everything. And You know, they've kind of made it uh, a subtle point that they're going to look at their options um, in the transfer portal and at at safety. And I I think that's also really going to be, or it is a point of emphasis now. Uh, Notre Dame's hosted a lot of targets on campus, um, safety targets, beginning with uh, Kennedy Erlacher, the son of Brian Erlacher, Pro Football Hall of Famer. Um, They've hosted two safeties from Texas, uh, Paul Menke and uh, Oliver Miles. Those are two under-the-radar guys, but um, guys that Notre Dame really likes. Um, They also had a player in from Rhode Island over the weekend and Utah, and Justin Denson and Davis Andrews. Both those guys are targets. Uh, Freeman saw Andrews at his high school in January. Golden saw Denson um, in Rhode Island uh, in January. So uh, Notre Dame's putting a point of emphasis on that safety position, and I think that we could eventually see some traction there because there's a lot of guys that really like Notre Dame, specifically Erlacher and uh, Menke. I think those are two guys Notre Dame can absolutely land. Um, But the other one right now, I think that's a a focus is linebacker. Uh, Things uh, have kind of shifted a little bit since James Laurinaitis' departure for Ohio State. He really took on uh, like that primary recruiter role as the uh, assistant linebackers coach. And uh, he had a lot of great relationships in the 24 cycle. As soon as he left, you saw a Darius Hayes, uh, a guy that visited in the winter on January junior day. He commits to Florida. 
Um, Peyton Pierce, another guy Notre Dame really, really liked. Um, he commits to Ohio State. He followed James Laurinaitis. Uh, Laurinaitis or Ohio State offered him about three days before Laurinaitis' uh, announcement to Ohio State became official. So there's some traction at the uh, safety position. They just had a uh, top 100 linebacker from St. John Bosco in California, which is a, a top five high school, one of the highly regarded programs in the country. And, you know, that's a guy that is coming out of his visit saying that uh, he's going to drop a top three. And he's already got an official visit scheduled with Notre Dame. He's got one scheduled with Ohio State. And I think USC is a major player there. So I think safety and linebackers are going to be the points of emphasis entering the summer. And although they don't have any prospects on the board yet, I don't think it's going to be long before they get some soon. Sticking with the defense here, Notre Dame appears to be right in the mix for a pair of five-star defensive linemen, including Justin Scott from St. Ignatius in Chicago and then edge rusher Eli Rushing out of Arizona. I know that Notre Dame fans, they hear they're in the mix for a five-star and they might be inclined to just sort of dismiss it after what happened with Keon Keeley last year and even Peyton Bowen, uh, even though he wasn't on the D-line. Where does Notre Dame currently stand with those two prospects? Yeah, um, I haven't made a formal prediction for uh, Justin Scott, but I, I do like Notre Dame leading there. Um, Miami is a team to watch coming out of uh, his visit uh, last, or wasn't last weekend, but the weekend before, the weekend of the, or actually the week, he spent um, several days in Miami over spring break with one of his high school teammates. But I think when all is said and done, I think Notre Dame is going to get Justin Scott. Academics are very high importance to his family. And playing close to home in Chicago is very important to him. And um, Notre Dame, I think, is uh, out in front there. And I expect them to uh, close the deal when all is said and done. As for um, Elijah Rushing, that's a uh, recruitment that's a little bit more challenging, I would say, uh, for Notre Dame at that at this aspect. Um, they do have working in their favor that he's been on campus twice. Um, I would be lying if I said when we heard he scheduled his official visit um, a month and a half ago or so that I, I was, wasn't was surprised. I was super surprised that um, that, that happened, and that was a, a super encouraging sign. Um, he just uh, released his official visit schedule uh, for, the, uh, for the summer. I know he's going to be at Oregon. I think he's going to be at Washington. Uh, there are a couple other schools in there as well. But I think that's one that Notre Dame's going to have to work, not necessarily work harder for, but they're going to have to make up a little more ground there. But um, certainly an incredibly encouraging sign that he's going to be back on campus. Al Washington was at his uh, high school back in January, and the Notre Dame coaches hit the road for evaluations over the next uh, month or so, and I fully expect them to be back at his high school. Uh, one team to watch with him, believe it or not, kind of a sleeper is Arizona. His uh, brother plays there. He's a walk-on. Arizona's in his backyard. Um, yeah, he's from Tucson, right? Yeah, uh, South Point yeah. Catholic. And, I, I mean, I don't think anyone's expecting him to go to Arizona, but I think that's just one school I have in the back of my mind that maybe if everything adds up right there. But, um, yeah, I think uh, Notre Dame, you know, an official visit could swing things heavily in their favor. and. Like I mentioned, he's been on campus twice already, all the way from Arizona, and this third one could uh, maybe be third time this charm. You never know when uh, someone gets up on an uh, official visit. All right, man, those are all the questions I have for you today. Tell the people where they can find you, and feel free to plug anything you've got in the works. Yeah, um, wow. <laughs> A lot of things in the works, I guess. It's just the weekend was so crazy with all the visitors and uh, been seeing kids on the road all across the Midwest. We'll have all that content on uh, Blue and Gold. I, I think we still got a special right now. It's twenty nine ninety nine dollars uh, through uh, fall camp in the end of August. I think that's an outstanding deal. You know, Mike Singer and I have been incredibly busy with our recruiting updates, which you can find on the uh, Loose Emoji board. Um, yeah, we're heavily active there, and you can find all our content on uh, Blue and Gold. And if you don't have a subscription already, uh, I think now's a – but a, a great time to uh, give us a chance. This is a very pro blue and gold podcast. We've had you on now. We've had Mike on the show before, as well as Tyler Horka a couple of times. So he is Kyle Kelly. I appreciate the time, man. And let's do it again soon. Sounds good.
That's a wrap for this episode of Locked On. Iris, thanks again to Kyle, and thank you for making this your first listen of the day. Remember to subscribe to the show if you haven't already, and give us a follow on any of our social media channels, which you can find on Twitter at Locked On Irish, on Instagram at Locked On Irish Pod, and my personal Twitter account at Tyler Wojak. That's at Tyler W O J C I A K. I'll see you guys tomorrow.